How you guys doing? Welcome to Tortoise Group's August 2018 meeting. So now we'll be introducing Christina Drake. So hi guys, uh, thank you so much for coming out today. It's kind of my goal today to give you a little bit more background than you may be familiar with on looking at the health of these tortoises, kind of understanding their physiology, and more importantly, understanding some of the challenges that we have with working with wild tortoises. It's one thing to have your pet tortoise and to, to look at it every day and you know what it's been eating, what it's been drinking, but when you only get to see these animals once or twice in their natural habitat, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand what condition they're in. So, as I mentioned before, sometimes we only get to see these animals once or twice. So at a quick glance, this individual might look pretty healthy. He's got some nice fat and muscle on his legs and his head. It looks like a pretty good wild tortoise. But if we're trying to understand what's potentially stressing this tortoise, it's kind of a, a Pandora's box. We really have no idea. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is develop a number of blood panels where you could take a small blood sample from these tortoises and maybe understand, is it struggling with drought? Has it been exposed to a pathogen? It might have a, a low level disease that we just can't see. There may not be the swollen eyes and the nasal discharge that you're used to seeing with um, mycoplasma infections. These guys eat balloons and a number of pieces of trash out in the desert. And you're, you're not gonna know that unless you actually see the balloon pieces coming out. So kind of the next thing is move into the, the tortoise's biology. These guys are resource deficient. There's not a lot of food and water out there most of the time. Occasionally we have some good years, but, but the, there's not a lot to work with out there. They respond slowly, they're tortoises. We know they're, they're slow moving on the ground, but I'm talking about at a cellular level. What might take us or other mammals a couple of weeks to kind of target a pathogen in us and get rid of it, could take these guys a year and a half. They can be very slow. They also have a low surface area to volume ratio. All I mean by that is if you're looking at a tortoise to try to understand how healthy is it, it's mostly a shell, a head, and four little legs. So there's not a lot there to physically kind of turn around and look at to see problems. And the next thing is probably the, I think one of the neatest factors of tortoises is they have a reduced metabolic capacity. And that goes right back into what Sarah just mentioned about estivation. So when times are tough, there's not a lot of food or water, they kind of dial back their metabolism as much as they can and go back into the back of their burrow and just wait it out. It's a fantastic evolutionary advantage for these. That's how they've made it, living on the edge in the desert for millions and millions of years. But because of that um, change in their metabolism, it, they do that, excuse me, back up. They do that with kind of this trade-off of their behavior, their physiology, and their metabolism. Kind of just not going very far, stand in the back of the burrow with their behavior, and then slowing everything down as much as they can to conserve the resources. But when they do that, it creates these huge seasonal and annual variations. So if you were to measure something in their blood, you might get huge spikes in the spring, and then it drops down in the summer when they're not doing a whole lot, and then it's back up again in the fall. So if you measured one population in April and you didn't get to the next one until June, you can't really compare those because the physiology of the June population might be a lot lower. And we know they're, they're slow growing, long lived animals. We know it's difficult, it's frustrating because I feel like we're moving at a snail's pace in reptile health. But um, one of the smarter moves we made a few years ago was instead of working with adult tortoises that have who knows what going on with them, let's work with small tortoises that we know where they started from, what they're eating, what they're exposed to, it's been a much more successful process this way. And let's do something where we know there's only like one stressor and let's make it kind of important for tortoises everywhere. And that's looking, at, um, excuse me, what we decided to do was look at what happens when you change their diet. Pretty simple, straightforward question. And the reason for that is when you get these fires out here all over the West and the Mojave Desert in particular, you get these invasive grasses that come in. Um, this is red brome. It's, it's native to the Mediterranean. It grows very well here. But the problem with this little grass is you can see it kind of, it dominates the landscape. So it's basically removing all the native plants that these tortoises would naturally be eating. So this is all that's left for them in a lot of areas. So it's important for us to understand what's happening for the health of these animals if they're stuck living in an environment like this. 
So to do this experiment, we grew a bunch of plants out in the greenhouse. This is actually brome when it's nice and green. It only, it only stays green for about a month and then it turns to that reddish brown color. But you can see we grew a, a mixture of forbs. Tortoises need a mixture of food plants. Um, that's the one little nugget that I hope you share with your neighbors and your friends is they really need a diversity of plants. So thank you to Tortoise Group for providing that list on your website. It's probably the number one question I get asked is what do I need to feed my tortoise? So I'm happy to just direct them to your website now. Um, kind of the next important thing for us is what animals are you going to study? So we spent years collecting eggs, raising them in an incubator, putting them in those little enclosures that Kobe mentioned, and then raising them for years before this, ex this study. So it's, this was a short five-month study, but a, about a five-year process to get us there before we could even get started. So here's kind of the setup. Um, these are some of the pens that Kobe mentioned. They're little enclosures. There's a burrow. The shrubs are a lot bigger now. This is when we first put them in. They're little shade structures. But you can see each week we just kind of drop the food pots that they were assigned to down in the ground and let them eat like they would normally be doing. And then we measured how much they were growing each month. And so you can see this is the plastron growth. So that's the bottom part of the shell. It was just easier for us to measure that, um, that part of the shell. The, the little circles in green, those are animals that were eating that mixture of native forbs. So they all grew really pretty quickly and, and kind of what you would expect to see in a small tortoise. The ones that were eating that brome didn't grow very much at all. And that, that's a problem. Um, and in fact, they had a whole slew of other health issues from, from eating that brome. So we know that tortoises are going to grow more and grow better when they have a mixture of native plants. So we thought, well, let's add in that gene panel that I mentioned before. So without going into too much detail, basically the animals that didn't have that, that mixture of native forbs and the nutrients that come with it, they didn't have enough um, uh, gene expression or enough um, protein production to harden their shell. There was no way they were going to grow and, and thrive the way you would want them to. And their, their immune function was completely flatlined. So if they had been exposed to pathogens, I'm not sure that these guys would have had the energy and the resources to fight that infection the way they should be. So kind of what that means in the bigger scheme of things is when you have these valleys like this, I feel pretty confident in saying small tortoises are probably not going to thrive there. And what's equally important is when you're telling your friends if they have Bermuda grass in their yard and that's it, there's no other food plants that they're letting them eat, it's kind of the same effect. Or if they're just feeding them iceberg lettuce, there's not a lot of nutrients in lettuce. So they, they really need a diversity of food plants to make them grow strong and have the immune function that they need. So what we're doing now is working with land managers to try to control and get rid of those grasses. There's, um, here you can kind of see where the, this is a side that has the invasive grass here, and then over here it doesn't. So our next big idea was how, we think we're doing a good job by restoring these habitats, but how are we going to know? So we've decided let's let the tortoises tell us. So let's put them back on. Uh, the landscape in areas that we think have been restored and then we'll just kind of monitor them for several years maybe five or ten everything in the tortoise world takes a long time and so we're going to be releasing 60 juvenile tortoises into these restored habitats and we're kind of chartered with looking at their growth health and survival health is a catch-all word for me because nobody actually defines it it's like what do you mean by health do you mean disease? Do you mean growth? Do you mean, you know, snotty noses? Um, so we're trying to, to define what that means. So as far as the health, we're back in the lab again, trying to develop new panels, new techniques. So we're working on some more fancy molecular techniques. We're also looking at their gut microbiome. So just like us, nothing happens in your gut unless the bacteria and the other microbes in there help break down the food. Same thing for tortoises. Kind of a cool fun fact with these guys is it takes them about 10 to 14 days to process food. So when they eat it, it sets in their hindgut or in the lower part of their colon and just sits there until these bacteria break down the plant cellulose and pull out the nutrients that they need. So if they have a messed up gut floor, they're not going to be pulling the nutrients out. So that's really important for us to understand. And we know nothing about that. I'm not 
I'm not going to glaze over pretending that we know anything. We don't. But I think it's a good place to start um, exploring this. So thank you guys so much over the years for helping us bring in tortoises. Um, you guys come out every week and help us feed and water and maintain these animals. We, we have been thoroughly vetting and screening these animals for a couple of years getting ready for this experiment. And that's really all you can do is time and patience and persistence with trying to pick out the, the best of these animals. And so you guys have definitely provided the first cohort and I'm sure as soon as uh, these animals are moved, um, you'll be able to come out and, and um, help with some different volunteer opportunities. I wanna back up and show you, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. When, uh, when we release these tortoises, they're gonna have a little radio tracker kind of glued to their butt here. And so that's why they, that's one of the three reasons why we have to raise them to a certain size. The first is you don't want predators to get them. The second is they have to be big enough to carry a, a little transmitter like this. And then, I forgot my third part there, but um, uh, anyway, sorry, it's gone. <laughs> um, so I think that was kind of the end of it. And I thank you guys so much for letting me come out and talk about this. Um, it's one of the best jobs I could possibly have, I think, is working with tortoises and trying to figure out how we can make their habitat a better place. So thank you.